How's everybody doing? As somebody said, it's the Friday after the exam, right? Do you have exam hangover? So one of the things I always like to do after uh, an exam is find out your impressions. What, what did you think about the exam? And my feelings aren't hurt if you don't like it or you hate my exam. Um, I appreciate the feedback, and I actually do use the feedback in my design of exams in terms of what people's impressions were. So give me your impressions of the exam. Some brave soul. Back in the back, a brave soul. They thought it was what? Okay, so you felt it was fair. Okay, I always like to hear that. I want the exam to be fair. I, I never write an exam to trick somebody, and I want the exam to be a fair assessment. That's why the word fair is important. A fair assessment of your uh, knowledge. And I'll be the first person to tell you that no exam that anybody writes, including me, um, is a perfect exam. And it's not a perfect assessment, because I can't ask you every single thing that you hopefully learned. Yes, back here. So do I know what the average is? The exam is still being graded. So the question is, do I know what the average is usually? It really varies from exam to exam quite a bit. On average, uh, the average is usually somewhere between about 60 and 70. Okay? Um, but you know, if it's a tough exam, it's lower. And if it's an easy exam, it's higher. And if it's a medium exam and you studied really well, it's higher, you know, those sorts of things. So we hope for the latter. Um, I was very, very um, impressed by something at the review session. And I told the TAs this because I think the TAs deserve some very good credit for what they've done in recitations this year. And that was in the, uh, the, amazingly to me, in the review session, I did not get one single question about a buffer. Not one. I've never had that happen. Now, I hope that means that you really knew the buffers, you really felt confident about the buffers, and you weren't too worried about the buffers. Um, and that, again, goes back to the recitations where the TAs have done just a great job of, of, of that. So I'm very, very happy with that. While I'm asking you about those sorts of things, what's your feeling of recitations? How are they going? Are they going well? Thumbs up, thumbs down. How many like what's happening in recitation? OK. How many don't like what's happening in recitation? My, my feelings don't get hurt. OK. OK. So if you have input on things like that, let me know. You know? If there's something that we can do, or if there's something that's not working, for example, um, or other things, then you know, I need to hear those things, because that's how we improve what we do. Yes? A little bit of a time crunch in the re recitations? No. For the exam. OK. How many felt the exam was, was long? Yeah, first exam. That's usually what happens. I had the sense that you didn't, compared to other classes, that it wasn't quite as rushed, but I understand, yeah, there's, there's that first exam, there's just a lot of material that's on that, and that commonly happens. What was the hardest part? Oh, yeah. Okay, the open ended questions, it was, you, didn't, you didn't quite get the direction of what you needed, right? Okay, okay. So one of the things I don't do is I don't post the key until we return the exams. We are aiming to turn the exams on Monday. That's our aim. So believe me, with a class of 370 students, getting those back is a, is a real challenge. Again, the TAs deserve some very good credit for that. Other exam comments? Everybody satisfied? OK. So uh, as you know, that exam uh, was a total of 25% of your grade. And the next exam is 25%. The participation in the recitations is 5%. And the final exam is 45%. So that's the layout of the course. And we'll go from there. OK. So if you have concerns at any time about your grade or how you're doing and so forth, please let me know. Please come see me. I'm always happy to meet with you. So um, we can talk about that. Well, last time I got started talking about the uh, mechanisms. And as I said, I'm not a mechanism guy. I don't really get that much into mechanisms. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about mechanisms and that we shouldn't understand the way in which enzymes work. Okay? Enzymes are as close to magic as we get um, in science. All right? Just absolutely amazing things that enzymes are doing that are mind-boggling. 
And so one of the things that I hope you take away from today's lecture, continuing what we talked about last time in last time's lecture, is that there are common themes, common mechanisms that different enzymes use. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that all the things I'm talking about are the only mechanisms that enzymes use, because that, that would be very misleading. But I do want you to see some common themes and common threads in the things that I'm talking about. Okay? So we'll go through those, and I try to keep these at a fairly basic level, all right, so that you can better understand what's happening with them. Well, last time we talked about serine proteases. And when we think about serine proteases, we have enzymes that are, of course, uh, uh, using a catalytic triad, the serine, histidine, aspartic acid. And I hope you took away from that talk the way in which those three amino acid side chains coordinate in order to activate something to make the reaction go. In the absence of that activation, and what was the activation, by the way? What was the activating thing? that made that reaction go? The what? Binding. binding, but binding caused something to be activated. What was, what was the thing that got activated that made that reaction go? The alkoxide ion. So we started out with a hydroxyl group, and that hydroxyl group lost a proton. That created the alkoxide ion, and that alkoxide ion was very reactive. So we have a reactive part of an enzyme as a result of that shape change that happens on the binding of the proper substrate. If we don't bind the proper substrate, we don't get activation of that hydroxyl group. And if we don't have activation of the hydroxyl group, we don't have the alkoxide. If we don't have the alkoxide, we don't have a reaction. And the evidence for that, of course, was when we mutated that serine, we saw that we basically took the enzyme out of the picture. We convert that serine hydroxyl group to a methyl group of alanine, and we don't have a reaction. Right? Everybody remembers that? OK. So that theme is going to carry through some of the things we're going to see today. We're going to see activation. We're going to see tetrahedral intermediates. We're going to see covalent intermediates. And we're going to see some twists on those. And one of the things I will want you to be thinking about is how these different mechanisms that I'll talk about here lead to different things happening during the catalytic process. Okay? So the first uh, category of enzymes I'm going to talk about, and by the way, all I'm, the, the, this first part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about three categories of proteases. So the serine proteases were one category from last time, and there are many serine proteases. And there are many of the types of proteases in the categories I'm going to talk about here today. Okay? So the first of these uh, is known as the aspartyl proteases. And they're called the aspartyl proteases because they use aspartic acid as part of their catalytic mechanism. Now, we don't see a catalytic triad. And by the way, one of the questions I commonly get of these other proteases is, well, do they have an S1 pocket? They're typically not called an S1 pocket, but every enzyme is going to have a substrate binding site. And that binding site is going to have features like that S1 pocket did. They're going to bind specific side chains, or some general side chains, maybe I should say. But they're not uh, going to be called the S1 pocket. Okay? But you can think of it as the, S, as the substrate binding site, just like the S1 pocket is the substrate binding site. OK, so the aspartyl proteases, we look at them and we see that, of course, they have side, two side chains um, of aspartic acid. Aspartic acid, of course, is the um, one of two uh, amino acids. It has the carboxyl group on the side. And you can see here that one of the carboxyls has become ionized, and the other one has not. And that might seem very strange to you, but it's not really that strange. When we talk about pKa values, you say, well, they've got the same pKa value. Why wouldn't they ionize? Why do you think that one might ionize and the other might not? Any thoughts? This is really exam hangover day, isn't it? The answer is that the electronic environment within the active site is not the same as an aqueous environment that's just open to water. 
So if I take aspartic acid and I put it in water, okay, then that aqueous environment that's surrounded by water is really going to, is how I measure my pKa values. But in the bowels of this protein, this is where the active site is, there's not as much access to water. And so the behavior of these side chains for ionization may be a little bit different than they are in just an, a pure aqueous environment. Okay? So don't be surprised if you see things behaving a little bit differently inside of a protein than they behave outside of a protein. All right, well, we see aspartic acid, and uh, you see a little bit of a hint of what's coming because you see the aspartic acid uh, basically grabbing that proton off of water. And we'll see how that uh, overall plays in the mechanism of the aspartyl proteases. The second category of protease I'm going to talk about today are the cysteine proteases. And the cysteine proteases are probably the easiest ones you're going to learn because the cysteine proteases are very, very similar in action to the serine proteases. They don't have a catalytic triad. They only have two amino acids that are involved in the catalysis, one being the cysteine, which is what gives them the name, and the other being the histidine, which you've seen before. Now, you could imagine with the cysteine proteases that we see something similar to what we saw with the serine proteases, and that is that the binding of the, substra the proper substrate causes the histidine to move a little closer to that cysteine, to pull the proton off and create uh, a, a reactive molecule. And that's exactly what does happen, as we'll see uh, in the mechanism in just a little bit. The third um, enzyme category that I'll talk about today are the metalloproteases. And though the metalloproteases look pretty different all right, in terms of mechanism, you'll see with them some common themes that are involved in all three of the other uh, protease uh, groups that I talked about. Metalloproteases typically have two features. One is that they have a side chain of an amino acid that's electron rich. And by the fact that I don't identify the amino acid means that there are several possible ones that can be there. And that electron rich amino acid side chain helps in the activation of water. And you've seen activation of water in the serine proteases. And I hope that you'll see that mechanism works here. The function of the metal in a metalloprotease is that it helps to hold the water so that it can be activated. Okay? So that's really the function of that. Again, all of these require the binding of the proper substrate. If the proper substrate doesn't bind, we don't get these activation steps happening. And without the activation steps, of course, we don't have a reaction occurring. OK. So um, I've listed a few uh, different proteases according to these categories that I've put here. So the cysteine proteases, some examples are papayan, which comes from uh, the papaya fruit, uh, cathepsin, calpane, and caspase. These um, last three are, are very commonly involved in uh, the process of signaling. Okay? So signaling, of course, is when cells are talking to each other, communicating information. Am I going to grow? Am I not going to grow? Am I going to divide? What's the message that I'm getting? And so that's the signaling process. The second category of um, proteases, uh, the aspartyl proteases, include uh, at least two other, uh, in, uh, two other proteases involved in signaling, the, the cathepsins, cathepsin D and cathepsin E. And this third one is pepsin. Pepsin is a really interesting protease in the sense that pepsin is um, an enzyme that's in your stomach. And it's active at a pH of about 1.5 to 2. Very few enzymes um, that are in our body, at least, that are active under those conditions. And if you think about it, it has to be, because of course our stomach is a very acidic environment, and having that enzyme be active, if it weren't active, we would have a lot more problems with digestion, right? So these are digestive enzymes that are involved in helping us to uh, digest our food. The metalloproteases. Uh, Two good examples there, one being carboxypeptidase A. And carboxy, oh, oh, what did I just do? This way, I hate projection software. Yeah, yeah. I complain too much, don't I? All right. Metalloproteases um, include carboxypeptidase A. And carboxypeptidase A is also a digestive enzyme. And it's very digestive because what carboxypeptidase A will do is, it, as I noted last time, it'll start at the carboxyl end of a protein. And it'll start chewing amino acids away, one at a time, sequentially. 
So if you have a protease, like I've talked about, that has specificity like, uh, let's say, trypsin, which cuts ne next to lysines and arginines, that's not going to completely digest a protein because there are many other amino acids in proteins. So in the digestive process, what we can see is that enzymes like trypsin will break a peptide into fragments, okay? And then those individual fragments can be broken into indiv individual amino acids by enzymes like carboxypeptidase A. The last enzyme there are the collagenases. And collagenases, as their name would suggest, are enzymes that help to break down collagen. Okay? And so why would you want to break down collagen? Isn't collagen connective tissue? Why do you want to break down your collagen? What's that? Remodel bones, OK. Yep, you do bone remodeling. That's one thing. What else? Come on, guys. What's that? Wound repair, very good, okay, so wound repair is important. There's at least one other biggie that nobody's thinking of. I'm about to turn on the electric jolts on your seats here, guys. You can tell it's Friday and you can tell the exam is done, right? What's that? What else, why would we want to break down collagen? What do we do on our breakdown, what, what breakdown processes are important to us? Digestion. Do you eat things that have collagen in them? Okay? Oh, duh, right? Yeah. He's only been talking about digestion for the past five minutes. Let's remember this, right? The effectiveness of a professor. Not very effective here, right? I, if, I, if I had that little jolt on the seats, I think maybe, maybe that, at least the worry about that, hands would go up real quickly, right? So, okay. Now that you're awake, let's go into mechanism, okay? So what's happening in these enzymes? I, again, um, I want you to get the big picture of these enzymes and to understand what's happening with them in terms of similarities with others, and then, of course, how these have unique features of their own. So the cysteine proteases, as their name suggests, of course, are enzymes that use a cysteine in their active site. Okay? Um, the process starts at the very top of this figure, where you can see the uh, side chain of cysteine, the SH group. And hiccup, <laughs> the, the uh, side chain of histidine, OK? And we can imagine that what's happened in the very top left is that the um, proper substrate has bound. And because the proper substrate is bound, we've seen a shape change, that histidine has moved closer to this, the sulfhydryl, and we see the removal of the proton. I don't like this figure. And by the way, I didn't draw this figure. I don't like this figure because it suggests that the removal of that proton happens before the binding of the proper substrate. That does not happen. Okay? So it's the binding of the proper substrate that causes <clears throat> the movement and then the abstraction of that proton from the sulfhydryl group. Okay? All right. Well, by the second slide up on the top, okay, there's the substrate binding. By the second slide up on the top, we see the proton has been removed, just like it was removed off of the uh, hydroxyl of serine. We move it off the hydroxyl of serine, we get an alkoxide ion, which is an oxygen that's sitting there full of electrons and is lurking, lurking, looking for a nucleus. Okay? No surprise, this sulfur is full of electrons and it's going to be looking for a nucleus. So in the serine proteases, we had an aspartic acid that was involved. In the, in the cysteine proteases, we don't see a third amino acid that's, that's playing a role in this process. Okay. No surprise, that electron-rich sulfur group is nucleophilic. It looks for a nucleus, and the nucleus that it looks for is exactly the nucleus that serine protease alkoxide ion looked for. It's looking for that carbonyl carbon. Carbonyl carbons are going to be electron poor because the oxygen has a greater electronegativity, and it's pulling the, it's pulling the electrons away. Well, the result of all that is that we get peptide bond breakage. But I want you to look and see that structure that's there and tell me what's similar to what we talked about with respect to serine proteases. What's similar to what we saw in the, in the mechanism of serine proteases in terms of structure? Tetrahedral intermediate. Who said that? Good for you. The tetrahedral intermediate, which was something that we had to stabilize with the oxyanion hole, 
is an intermediate in this process as well. And what happened after we made that tetrahedral intermediate in the serine proteases? The bond falls apart. Okay? So we saw the peptide bond break as a result of that. No surprise, that's what we're seeing here. Gesundheit. And in the process of that, the proton moves from the histidine nitrogen to the amine group of the released peptide. And the same thing happens in the serine protease. I didn't point that out to you at the time, but I pointed out here uh, and tell you that it's a common feature of the two. Okay? We've got to replace that, that proton. That proton's coming back onto here. Well, at this point, we see we have completed the fast phase of the cycle. The fast phase of the cycle is the breaking of the bond and the release of the first peptide. So the first peptide is now out of the picture. It's going to leave. It's going to exit the active site of the enzyme. Okay? And the second peptide is covalently attached to the sulfur, as you can see. And that's exactly like what happened in the serine proteases. The removal of that second peptide is a little bit different in cysteine proteases than it, is in, than it was in the serine proteases. But the mechanism by which it happens is exactly the same. What we see is that that, that um, second part of the peptide doesn't really get released as such. And we'll, we'll see that in a second. Okay? So in the second part of the process, we have water coming in, just like we have with the serine proteases. That water gets activated. And how does it get activated? By the histidine, just like it was in the serine proteases. The activation of the water involves the removal of a proton. And that removal of a proton causes the hydroxyl to attack the, um, uh, in this case, the sulfur carbon bond. And when that happens, we form, guess what, a tetrahydral intermediate again. That tetrahydral intermediate is unstable, and the bond between the sulfur and the carbon breaks. Oop. The bond between the sulfur and the carbon breaks. And the peptide is released from the bond. Notice that, that above that arrow, we see R, C double bond, O, O, H. That thing is still actually held onto by the enzyme until the next process gets started. So it takes a little while before that second peptide is fully out of the enzyme. But you can see that after it has been, the, the sulfur carbon bond has been broken, that there's no uh, link between the two. And the enzyme is back to its original state. OK, it's a little clear, unclear at the end. Does that make sense? Question? No, a question over there? Is that a question? Oh, OK. Yes? Say it again. Which protein, which protease was involved in inflammation? I don't remember which one I was talking about. I have to look at the, the, the section to see, to be honest with you. There are many uh, proteins that are actually involved in infl inflammation. Yeah. OK, nucleophilic attack, bond breakage, there. OK, so that's what happens with cysteine proteases. We move now to aspartyl proteases. And aspartyl proteases, I show this figure. I really like this figure because it shows us up close and personal what's actually happening. We're not seeing schematics, but we're actually seeing a three-dimensional projection of an aspartyl protease, and the relevant players in this are identified. The first of this is that the substrate has bound to this enzyme, and you can see the substrate as the stick figure uh, on the top. And we see that the two aspartate side chains that we saw schematically in the earlier figure are shown below in red. And we're seeing the side chains of those projecting upwards into close proximity of the substrate. Now, what happens in aspartyl proteases is that there's actually just a little bit more space there than it shows because it's not the aspartates that are attacking the carbonyl carbon, but rather an activated water. So there's a water that fits in between the aspartate side chains and the substrate, as we will see. All right. Well, let's look at, take a look and see what happens with that um, uh, reaction mechanism here. So, this is depicting the exact same thing that you saw in that, that last slide. At the very top, we have the substrate. And beneath it, we see the two aspartate side chains. And between those two, we see a water. Okay? So there's the water molecule that's there. So the first step in the activation 
of an aspartyl protease is the activation of water. <clears throat> well, you saw activation of water, of course, when we talked about the serine proteases and also the cysteine proteases because the activation of water was necessary for the release of the covalently bound peptide. The activation of water here involves pulling a proton off of water. You've heard this, seen this theme before. And the removal of the proton off of water creates a hydroxyl that then attacks the carbonyl carbon, exactly like you saw before. There's a nucleophilic attack. And the nucleophilic attack results in breaking of the peptide bond. Notice the intermediate in the middle figure. There's your tetrahydral again. That tetrahydral intermediate is unstable. It falls apart. And when it falls apart, something different happens here than happened before. What's different here from what happened with the serine and cysteine proteases? What's that? No covalent bond. Okay. So we didn't have attack by a, a side chain of an amino acid to make that. So consequently, there's nothing for the protein to be covalently attached to. It becomes covalently attached to water, which means that the peptide gets broken in two. There's no second step. We don't have to have a fast step and a slow step with an aspartyl protease. We have one step. One step, attack of the carbonyl carbon, and the bond breaks, and the two pieces fall apart. So in essence, this is a simpler mechanism than the ones we talked about before. Okay? And that's what's happening in aspartyl proteases. Questions about that? Yes? Why isn't there a covalent bond? So there's not a covalent bond because if you think of the cysteine protease, we had the alkoxide ion, which was the side chain of an amino acid that attacked the carbonyl carbon, and that was the covalent bond. One was released and the other was attached, right? In the cysteine protease, we had activation of a sulfur. The nucleophilic attack was in the sulfur is the side chain of the cysteine. So when it attacks, it becomes covalently bound, and we see the one being released, and then that sulfur carbon bond had to be broken. Here, what's doing the attacking is water. So water is attacking it. Water is not, covalent, not physically attached to the enzyme, right? So when the water attacks this, the water becomes attached to one side of the peptide. That is, the hydroxyl group becomes attached to one side of the peptide. But there's no uh, attachment to the enzyme. So it, it, it's not physically attached. Does that make sense? OK. OK. So there's your tetrahydral intermediate. And there's the breakage of the peptide bond and immediate release of water. All right, well, we've seen a common theme in those proteases. Let's talk about another enzyme that I uh, de described in class that works amazingly fast. This enzyme is, car is carbonic anhydrase, and it's the enzyme that's responsible for dissolving carbon dioxide in your blood. I showed you that carbon dioxide could be attached to hemoglobin. And when it gets attached to hemoglobin, it um, um, displaces protons and goes back to the lungs where it gets released, right? What I didn't tell you was that that's actually a relatively minor way of moving carbon dioxide from tissues out to our lungs. The major way in which carbon dioxide gets moved is by bicarbonate ion, which is the HCO3 minus that you see in this figure. Bicarbonate ion simply being dissolved in the aqueous environment of the blood. Most of the carbon dioxide in our body travels via that route. <coughs> Excuse me. So that means that this enzyme reaction is really, really important. Carbon dioxide is a poisonous gas. Getting this stuff dissolved in the aqueous environment of our blood is very important. And this actually plays a role, though I won't go into it here, but it plays a role in maintaining the pH of our bloodstream. OK, well, this enzyme is an interesting enzyme. And its activity suggests something about uh, at different pHs suggest something about the way in which it actually works. Let's look at the activity as measured by KCAT for this enzyme at different pHs. Now you might say, well, KCAT's a constant. No, it's not. If I denature an enzyme and I measure its KCAT, what's going to be its KCAT? Zero, right? So it's only a constant for an active enzyme. And we can imagine there could be different degrees of activity, right? <coughs> 
And those different degrees of activity may be a function of pH, and sure enough, they are. Here's the KCAT for carbonic anhydrase at pH 5.9, a fairly acidic environment. It's making 10,000 molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per second. If I raise the pH to 6.3, whoa, 14 times greater, 140,000 molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per second. If I go to pH 7, 410,000 molecules of product per molecule of enzyme per second. It gets better. At 7.5, it's up to 700,000. At 7.9, it's up to 810,000. This is one of the reasons when you see this enzyme activity reported, you'll see different KCAT values because it really varies a lot on the pH at which you measure it. This enzyme I can take to pH 8.1, and it's up to 900,000. And something even more amazing, this enzyme, if I take it to pH 9, is not only still active, it's maximally active. Wow. Now, it may not be apparent to you. You might think, well, the enzyme just happens to like pH 9. But it turns out that this information is telling us something about the catalytic mechanism of this enzyme. So I'm going to take. Uh, a couple minutes and show you that catalytic mechanism and show you why pH really matters for how this enzyme works. The catalytic mechanism of this enzyme is shown on the screen here. No surprise, we see water involved again, and we see a divalent cation, in this case zinc, holding onto the water, kind of like we had in a metalloprotease. Okay? It's holding onto that water, and the negative end is the oxygen end, so we see the, the oxygen being held by that. And we see that the, the zinc is being held by three different histidines. Okay? In the next step of the process, we see loss of a proton. Now, this is actually the step that that last slide was giving us a clue for. It tells us that the mechanism of this enzyme requires ionization of water. When is water going to be more likely to lose a proton? As the pH goes up. The higher the pH, the lower the proton concentration, the more likely water is going to lose a proton. So if we create conditions where water loses a proton, we favor this mechanism happening. Do you suppose this will be maximally active at pH 14? How many say yes? Nobody? Everybody, does that mean everybody says no, or nobody even heard? There's a yes. Okay. Well, the answer is no. <laughs> we knew that, Ahern, right? Okay. We knew that. Okay. The reason the answer is no is, of course, we not only have to think about the enzyme mechanism, but what else? Enzyme structure, right? So I can imagine I might be denaturing the enzyme at some point, and that's right. So at pH 9, I haven't yet denatured the enzyme. And so I'm maximally favoring this intermediate. I'm going to show you the rest of the, the, the process in just a second. But I haven't denatured the enzyme. Once I start to denature the enzyme, then of course I'm going to see the KCAT doing this. Right? There's an old thing people used to talk about with respect to flies behaving like an ideal gas. Have you ever heard this one? Flies behave like an ideal gas. You've all studied ideal gases in, in freshman chemistry, right? An ideal gas, they random, they move, and their movement, rate of movement, is proportional to their temperature. So if you have flies in a box at, P, at, at, at a temperature of the refrigerator, the movement of flies in that box is pretty slow, and you heat it up, and they go a little faster, and you heat it up, and they go a little faster, until you get them up to about 40 degrees centigrade, at which they stop behaving like an ideal gas because they all fall to the bottom of the box. Right? So there are limits, and same things happen with enzymes. Okay. Um, the next step of the process, we see entry of carbon dioxide into the active site. And this is important because, obviously, we want to solubilize carbon dioxide. And we have this activated hydroxyl, just like we saw in the various proteases that I've talked about. And it attacks that, that carbon because that carbon is electron poor. It's a nucleophilic attack. And when that nucleophilic attack occurs, we see this covalent intermediate which is HCO3 minus. There's bicarbonate for you right there. Okay? And water comes in and releases the bicarbonate. 
It's a very simple mechanism. The only real important part of it is that ionization of the water. Okay? Consequently, when water enters, we go back to the original state and the process continues. Simple mechanism, very rapid for an enzyme to turn it over. Okay, the last group of enzymes I want to talk about today are the restriction enzymes. Okay? Restriction enzymes are pretty cool, not only for what they do, but for why they exist. Okay? Why do restriction enzymes exist? Well, before I talk about what they exist, I want to tell you what they do. Right? So restriction enzymes are enzymes that specifically cut DNA at specific sequences, okay? and they chop it into pieces. There's a variety of different kinds, but the kind I'm going to talk about today is the most common kind. And they're called restriction enzymes. They're also called restriction endonucleases. These enzymes are found only in bacteria. Only in bacteria. And bacteria use them as a kind of defense against the rest of the world. Well, how does that play out? Okay. Well, imagine, if you will, that I'm a virus, and I'm floating around here and I'm really happy because I've got a lot of food around me and I'm taking up all this food and doing my thing. And viruses like every other, I'm sorry, uh, bacteria like every other cell on the face of the earth is susceptible to viruses. The viruses that attack bacteria are known as bacteriophages or phages. People call them both things, bacteriophages or phages. These are viruses that attack and replicate in bacteria. And you can imagine that when a virus attacks a bacterium, it's going to kill it. Right? Well, if we get a virus, we may lose a bunch of cells in our throat or something like that because we get a sore throat and our body sloughs them off and we recover and we're fine. If I'm a bacterium, I'm a single cell, I really don't want to get any virus. I can't afford to do that, right? So bacteria have evolved this protective system, which includes enzymes that break down DNA. So if a, if a virus grabs onto a bacterium and it injects its DNA into the bacterial cell, if the, virus, if the bacterial cell has no protection, then that DNA is going to code for viral proteins, it's going to take over the cell, it's going to burst the cell, and the cell's dead and the virus is going to proliferate. If the cell has a way of breaking down that DNA that comes in, right, then it can protect against a viral infection. And that's what restriction endonucleases do. They recognize and cut specific DNA sequences. So I want to show you one of those um, restriction enzymes today and the mechanism that it uses, and then talk a little bit about that, what's called the modification system that protects the viral, I'm sorry, protects the, the bacterial DNA. Because we don't want this cutting randomly, at least the bacterium doesn't. It doesn't want to cut its own DNA, it only wants to cut the viral DNA. So I'll talk about that later. First I'm going to talk about the mechanism that a restriction enzyme uses to cut DNA. Well, here's a restriction enzyme shown in green. It's bound to a, a DNA duplex. Yes? The question is, can you have interactions between the viral DNA and the bacterial DNA? You certainly can. But that doesn't have any effect on what I'm, what I'm talking about here. Yeah. So there's, there's not, a, not a problem with that. In the process of catalyzing the breaking of DNA, there's a couple things that has to happen. First, the restriction enzyme has to bind to DNA. And then what it does, it goes, kind of goes sliding along the DNA. And what it's doing is it's literally looking for a specific sequence. It will only cut at a specific sequence. When it hits that specific sequence, it will stop. And here's the cool thing. It will actually bend. Okay? It will stop, and it will bend the DNA at that sequence. And it's the bending that's important for the catalytic mechanism of the enzyme. Okay. The enzyme I want to talk about here is called HIND3. There are hundreds of restriction enzymes, each one cutting at specific sequences. HINDI3 recognizes the sequence you see on the screen, AAGCTT. You see the ends on the outside, it means it doesn't matter what those bases are. It's embedded 
it's a whole bunch of DNA around it. But in the middle of this thing, here's an AAGCTT. If you look at the bottom strand, you read it from the A side, you see it's symmetrical. It also reads AAGCTT. Okay? What the enzyme does is this. It cuts that into two pieces, and it leaves what's called a staggered end. We see a little bit hanging off of each end. Okay? Let's talk about how it does this. All right? This schematic shows the steps in the process. And we can see in the middle, we see a phosphate. That phosphate is part of the phosphodiester bond of a DNA molecule. So we don't see the whole DNA. We just simply see the phosphate of that. And you'll notice that the, en the, um, ends I'm sorry, the amino acids in the active site are labeled as E's and D's. And you see that E is glutamic acid, D is aspartic acid. And this environment is very rich in the side chains of glutamic acid and aspartic acid, meaning it's very negatively charged. We also see the involvement of magnesium ions. They're labeled as ME, not MG, but ME standing for metal. And most commonly, those are magnesium ions that are there. The bending of that DNA duplex that happens on the proper binding causes the environment that you see on the screen to be in place. Just like we saw the proper binding of substrate in a protease to make those movements of electrons, the bending of the DNA allows this structure that you see on the screen to happen. If the bending does not occur, no reaction. And the bending only occurs when the proper sequence is bound. Okay, so look what's happening here. We see activation of water. Seen this mechanism before? Okay, see a nucleophilic attack. And I'm not gonna go through all the steps here, and this is actually a little bit different, so I'm not gonna try, try to parallel that. But suffice it to say, we get to an intermediate that literally falls apart like we saw in the proteases. You see the electronic reorganization that's happening. You see another water that's coming in. And the upshot of that is that the bond, the phosphodiester bond, of one strand is broken. The same thing happens on the other strand. Now, this happens because of the bending. This happens because of the activation of water. And if we don't do that bending, we don't get this reaction occurring. So how in the heck, then, does the cell protect itself from cutting its own DNA? If this enzyme is cutting AAGCTT, that, that sequence occurs at random about once every 4,000 nucleotides, at random. So a virus that's got 40,000 nucleotides or 100,000 nucleotides most likely has several copies of that. You cut it into pieces, the virus DNA doesn't function anymore. But the cell DNA has about five or six million sequences, five or six million bases. We can imagine it would be full of AAGCTTs, right? Well, it turns out that the cell has a protective mechanism. It's called a methylase. What a methylase does is it's paired with a restriction enzyme. And it's paired meaning that they're both present in the same cell. They're not physically attached to each other, typically. They're present in the same cell. And the methylase recognizes exactly the same sequence as the restriction enzyme. The methylase recognizes AAGCTT in the case of the Hindi-3 methylase. So we have a Hindi-3 methylase, and we have a Hindi-3 restriction enzyme. The cell is going to have both of these. So what does the methylase do? It goes around, and when it sees DNA, it puts methyl groups on it, just like you see here. And what do those methyl groups do? Well, the methyl groups are such that when the restriction enzyme comes along the DNA and it goes sliding along, it no longer sees this as an AAGCTT. It does not stop. It does not bend the DNA. It therefore does not cut the DNA. And so the cellular DNA is protected. There's the most common question I always get at this point. What's the most common question you suppose I get at this point? I'll give you a minute to cogitate on that. What's the most? Yeah. How does it keep from methylating the viral DNA? The answer is it doesn't. <laughs> so it's a race. Which enzyme gets there first? The reason that question comes up is we want biology to be perfect. Everybody wants biology to be perfect. We want to have a perfect system so that it never cuts the viral DNA. We don't have comfort in thinking, well, sometimes the cell's going to die. 
right? Could you imagine that in the race that sometimes the bacterial restriction enzyme might cut its own DNA? It might, okay? So it's not a perfect system, but it's a very good system because usually the incoming DNA gets grabbed by the restriction enzyme first. Question? No. So she said that the, the uh, methylase only recognizes the cellular DNA and then the restriction enzyme recognizes the uh, viral DNA. No. So either of those can recognize either. Generally, the, the cell's DNA will have already been modified first. So the cell's DNA is way ahead. But either the methylase or the restriction enzyme could grab that viral DNA coming in. If the methylase gets there first, what's going to happen, guys? It's going to be protected. But remember, we've got multiple sequences that are in that virus, most likely. So why, even if the, the uh, methylase gets to one of the sites first, the restriction endonuclease may get to the other site first, right? So on average, it's going to be harder for the virus to win. But it can win. Yes? The methylase is protecting against cutting by the restriction enzyme. And the methylase has no way of knowing, is this the viral or is this the cellular sequence? OK, so when that happens, we don't see the cutting. We see protection. And consequently, we're right there. Question? Yeah? Is there a localization in the cell? That's a very good question. Bacteria tend to have very little localization of DNA compared to eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells, of course, keep the uh, DNA in the nucleus. But in recent years, we've come to realize that there is a little bit of localization. There's something called a nucleoid, which is where the bacterial DNA is kept. And that localization may, in fact, provide a little bit of protection for the bacterial DNA. So very good question, very good thought. Yeah, yeah. What's the success rate for a bacterial cell? Um, I can't give you a number, but I can tell you that um, I, I have worked with putting DNAs into cells, into bacterial cells. And there are strains of bacteria that have, have had their restriction enzyme system removed because we want to put DNAs in and we don't want to get them chopped up. If I compare my success rate of getting uh, a DNA in with, um, without a restriction endonuclease system, with that with a cell that has a restriction endonuclease system, you would say, well, if it has a restriction endonuclease system, it's going to cut up the DNA you try to put in. If you know the success rate of getting it in, you would have an idea about how well that's protected. I would say it's about 1,000 to 1, based on what I've seen. That is, I get about 1 1,000th one as many cells that actually get stable DNA that I put in them if the restriction endonuclease is present compared to if it's not. So it's pretty darn efficient. Okay, well, we're almost out of time. I think we should have a metabolic melody to remember all of this. Today, I don't have a recording, so you're going to have to help me with this one. I think it's a tune that you will know. All right, it's to the tune of Chim Chim Cheree. Everybody know that song? Okay, please join me. Ready, get set. I'm obsessed with AAGCTT because it's the binding site of Hindi 3. Cutting up DNA most readily. The ends are not blunt when they're cut up, you see. Five prime overhangs A, G, C, A of AGCT. Sorry. Bacteria don't have an immune system, so they must fight off phages or they will not grow. Protection by chopping's their strategy, and one of the cutters we call Hindi 3. On binding of AAGCTT, the site recognition sites bent easily. Phosphodiester bonds attacking, meanwhile, has water behaving as nucleophile. To stave off the phage for a little while, why don't these enzymes cut cells' DNAs? The answer is provided by a methylase. Adding a methyl drop on top of what? The sequence these enzymes would otherwise cut. So cells get protected in this simple way from nuclease chewing of their DNA. Phage is not lucky in most every case unless methylases win the enzyme race.
If that happens, then the cell gets erased. Woo! All right, guys.